This is a presentation about language attitudes that are expressed in two Bahrain recordings. As a general overview, I'm gonna give a brief introduction. I'm gonna talk more specifically then about the context of the two recordings. And then the majority of this talk will be covering the language attitudes that are expressed in these recordings with a few words of conclusion at the end. As an introduction, I'll briefly talk about the researcher context or positionality of this work, talk about the Gera region of Chad where this language is found, give some information about the Bahrain language itself, its vitality, the work that's being done in a grassroots literacy program, and the study of the language through language documentation and description. For myself, I'm a postdoctoral fellow at SOAS, University of London. I began studying Bahrain in 2010 as a member of SIL and have almost exclusively worked on the language from descriptive, comparative, and formal linguistics frameworks. So this is the first study of Bahrain from a social perspective. And so if it seems a bit amateurish, that's probably because it is. This is also a study that's an opportunistic use of content from a language documentation corpus, taking advantage of the fact that the corpus is multi-purpose. So it's not a specifically designed study to look at language attitudes among the Bahrain. The Bahrain live in the Gera region of Chad. Chad's found in Central Africa, the population of about 16 million. The ethnologue associates 133 languages with Chad and the glottologue about 146 languages. The Gera region is found in the central part of Chad, and there are about 25 languages indigenous to this region. These languages come from several different linguistic families or stocks. The Bahrain language is part of this Chadic group you see in the pink color, but some of the neighboring languages include Aramawan languages, uh, which are part of the Niger Congo phylum, as well as Nilo Saharan languages like Bukirmi and uh, Kanga. And the language of water communication in the area is Chadian Arabic, a Semitic language. There are about 6,000 people that make up the Bahrain language group, and they form four self-identified subgroups. The Jalkia and Gilia are the largest of these two groups, and they're also the only two mutually intelligible dialects. So Bahrain could also be seen as one language of 4,000 people and two other languages of about 1,000 people each. The Bahrain language continues to be transmitted to the next generation. Uh, it would be considered level 6A, a vigorous language in the EGIT scale or safe in the UNESCO scale. It also meets the Africa specific criteria for language vitality suggested by Luca and Storch, with one potential uh, area for concern being the socioeconomic stability of the area. At the moment, the Bahrain are relatively isolated from uh, the national economy, although as development continues to grow in the area, there is certainly going to be an influx of opportunities and culture and language uh, changing in this area. There's been an ongoing literacy program in the Bahrain for several years. This started in 2009 with the creation of the Association for the Development and Promotion of the Bahrain Language. This was a grassroots movement that so was begun with very little outside influence. This organization joined a federation of associations for the development of national languages, which has been operating in Chad since 2001. The Bahrain Language Association began literacy classes with 15 adult classes in 2011, which have continued steadily year by year. And in 2016, they added preschool classes for children. My own work with the language has been focused on description and documentation of the language. This began in 2010 when I was working with SIL CAD, and my focus was on phonological and morphological analysis specifically with the goal of developing a literacy primer for the language. My work with that year, over that year with that language was primarily with Musa Adu, who you see here in the picture. I left Chad at the beginning of 2011, but continued to work with the data developing it into a grammar sketch for a master's thesis. 
and then returned to work on a PhD thesis on serial bird constructions, which was finished in 2018. Part of that research program included a ELDP small grant for language documentation, during which we collected 16 hours of video and about 48 texts from that corpus have been annotated at this point. Now to give a bit more specific information about the context of the two recordings we're going to look at. These recordings were done during the 2017 ELDP language documentation project. And this aspect of the project was guided by Usman Amin, who was at the time the president of ADPLB, the Bahrain Language Association. And it was his idea to include nearby villages of Mosul and Mebra in the documentation uh, project. But he also wanted to go to those villages in order to recruit new teachers for literacy classes, which is why the topic of language attitudes comes up in some of the recordings. Uh, the Language Association also invited Musa Adu, the language consultant I had worked with previously, to join us on this trip. So looking at a map of the Bahrain area, zooming in on the town of Melfi, the main town of this area, we just drove northwest, first stopping at Mosul before continuing to Mebra. In the visit to Mosul, there were 10 people who volunteered to speak for the video recording. Most people spoke about agriculture or told a folk tale, but Ramadan Abdullah stood up to give a long and passionate speech about language use. The specific topic wasn't solicited, but it seems that he's responding to the appeal for volunteer literacy workers made by the Language Association. He describes his topic with a word borrowed from Chadian Arabic, the adjective har, which means difficult, burning, or stinging. And so we get a, a sense right away that he's addressing this as a very uh, serious and emotive topic. Here's a clip of Ramadan beginning his speech. In the Bukhi hara ju na, gandan shula ju den dunya ju. Hara ju den shula ju den dunya na, ane jalkiya, jalkiya tinna, wajib. Bukhi si di dio genne, bukhi na jalkiya na panun tu bas. Wati la jalkiya na, nanda ngani shonda ane wengna, bukhi ni do padlo. Ramadan's speech continues for about eight minutes. Uh, and he brings up a lot of different themes throughout the speech with a few tangents here and there, but continues to return to the theme of uh, language use and the importance of language in the community. It can be divided into 11 general uh, sort of thematic sections. We won't go into each of these, but just try to highlight some of the main points. Now, after the visit to Mosul, we continued on to Mebra. Musa Adu then was with us in Mosul to hear Ramadan's speech but he didn't respond directly at that point. But when we arrived in the next town in Mebra, Musa was among those who volunteered to speak for the recording. His recording begins with a speech about the history of the town of Mebra, this, the village of Mebra. And then he transitions to speaking about the Bahrain language. Ramadan was not present at this point, but Musa's speech can still be seen as a response to the themes that are brought up in Ramadan's speech. This is the point in the recording where Musa switches from talking about the history of Mebra to talking about the language. Musa's speech is a bit shorter and can be divided into five different thematic sections, talking about young people uh, potentially losing the Bahrain language, talking about others who write their languages, talking about consistency in writing and ending with focusing on uh, the legacy of the elders who will pass away. Now in this section, I want to talk about some of the language attitudes that are expressed in this recording. Before I do that, I just want to mention that, of course, speech communities are not homogenous. Not all Bahrain people necessarily share the same linguistic ideologies. There's also likely to be variation by age and gender. These recordings are of two older men who have their own particular perspectives. And I also want to point out that these expressed ideologies are not necessarily dogma. 
that they might change from context to context, that these same people might express their uh, attitudes about languages differently in another context or for another reason. But generally, in these two recordings, there are clearly four ideologies that are expressed, which have already been labeled by Macintosh in a 2005 paper. These are linguistic authenticity or purism, linguistic permanence, ethno-linguistic linking, and religio-linguistic linking. The two speakers generally share or at least have compatible uh, views on these four ideologies, but they contrast very sharply on their position on the value of literacy in Bahrain. On the first ideology, that of linguistic authenticity, we already heard Musa speak disapprovingly of children, each speaking in their own way, which is presumably referring to them speaking the wrong way. Ramadan, for his part, speaks about the problem of mixing languages, although while he does this, he's also using Arabic origin words. The speakers aren't very specific about their criticism of language use. And all they talk about mixing, both of them use Jadian Arabic words in their own speech. The, their complaints about the way the language is changing could be interpreted as a discourse of nostalgia rather than a specific linguistic complaint about particular structures or vocabulary. It's also interesting to point out that in their view of the language, you see that there's an underlying assumption of a reified or essentialist view of language. Lufka and Storch claim that such ideologies are rare in the African context. Although in Chad, at least impressionistically, these attitudes seem to be more common than they might be in, say, Senegal or Cameroon. The next ideology expressed is that of linguistic permanence. Ramadan explicitly says that the language cannot be lost. Musa, on the other hand, doesn't seem to explicitly endorse this idea and in fact suggests that languages could disappear. But he doesn't uh, emphasize this uh, rhetoric of language endangerment. Like Ramadan, he instead emphasizes not that the language is in danger, but rather that the people who stop speaking the language are in danger. Here's Ramadan speaking about the fact that the language cannot disappear. Balu in 2020 suggests that people who hold a view of language permanence are much less likely to take on activist role in maintaining or prom promoting the use of the language. And this is very much true in the case of Ramadan, uh, where he seems to not want to see any literacy activity happening in his village. Musa doesn't have this problem, but he seems to be much more open to the idea that languages can disappear. The third ideology expressed is that of ethno-linguistic linking. Ramadan, his part, speaks of language as a birthright. He says that you will be lost without your language and gives an example of potentially being enslaved by another group and not being able to speak your language. Musa says it's an embarrassment not to be able to speak your language, and he invokes the shameful idea of becoming a Sokoro or Arabic speaker. Here's Ramadan on language as a birthright. Bugidishundena <laughs> 
And then here's Musa speaking about what happens if you end up becoming a Sokoro or Arabic speaker. Ethnolinguistic linking is often seen as a tool of Western nationalism, although Foley has pointed out that minority languages groups can also adopt an ideology of linguistic purism as a method of preservation of ethnic identity in the face of challenges from majority groups, which may be the case in Bahrain. The fourth ideology expressed is that of religio linguistic linking. Ramadan links speaking your language to preserving your history, which is needed to get into heaven and to avoid suffering for your grandchildren. Uh, Musa does not express this kind of ideology. It's interesting to note that despite being in an Islamic context, Bahrain is considered vital for religious purposes, not Arabic. <laughs> Then on the topic of literacy in Bahrain, the two men have very different opinions. Ramadan's entire speech can be read as a negative reaction to the proposal of literacy classes in his village. But Musa, on his part, explicitly argues for literacy in Bahrain and brings up three different points. First, he argues that it's important to teach the next generation for their own benefit. Second, he points out that writing is not just for white people. And third, that writing is not self-evident. After complaining about children speaking their own way, as we've seen, Musa warns that children might not be able to find the Bahrain language in the future. And so he encourages the people of Nebra to install a literacy teacher to prevent this. Then Musa also points out that other groups have literacy, first saying that the white people have literacy, but then realizing that that might not be a strong motivation in post-colonial Chad, he also points out that people he calls non-white, the Chinese, as well as Arabs, Kunari, and Hausa also have literacy, then asks why the Bahrain do not. Finally, Musa addresses those who may feel like they don't need to learn their language as something they already know. And he points out that people may have different ways of writing and not understand each other. The example that he brings up is quite uh, interesting because it's the word nyalme or snake that begins with the palatal nasal. And he points out that people may not have the same way of writing this palatal nasal, which could lead to different spellings and confusion about the meaning of words. Yeah. 
dan sullo ne na tidde goti jogodoji to ndege jino fayina erna atinna danga do na nilla ne tali ka do na so ndali na do gandan do nilla mani jange jango de fana na na sara ke wala si go nde gena wala na si dudi eh faje giti nan de wali ga nyelme to ndo wala kato ba yo ti alido ti duwa ti jange ti je tidi goti wala je le tidi a to ni dokki do na ma baden I'd well, like to offer some brief conclusions on what we can learn from the ideas expressed in these recordings. One point is that linguistic authenticity and linguistic permanence have been pointed out as ideologies that discourage linguistic activism. Musa's strategy in responding to these ideologies is not to directly confront them or to point out that they're wrong or even to change his own ideologies. Rather, he frames his appeal for ling language activism in a way that fits the existing ideologies, focusing not on language endangerment, but focusing on the next generation and their well being. This fits something that Dorian said in a 1994 paper. A common challenge for language revitalization and language revival is to limit the restrictive role which puristic attitudes are likely to play in the communities in question, or to channel such attitudes into forms which are useful rather than harmful. More specifically, on the case for mother tongue literacy, there are two obstacles that come up in Musa's discussion that we might learn from. One is the obstacle of literacy being seen as a white or a colonial activity. The response in Musa's uh, speech is to point out that there are also non-white forms of literacy. Another obstacle is the idea that literacy is for language learners and those who are language experts don't feel like they have a place in a literacy class. Musa's response suggests that literacy could be reframed not as an individualistic self-improvement project, but as a community-led effort that requires experts in order to develop consensus for writing the language. That's all I have to share for now. Here are the references that have been cited in this presentation. Look forward to hearing your questions.